Welcome to the 10th lecture for Regulatory Frameworks for Environmental Management and Planning. Today we're looking at the EPBC Act, or Commonwealth Environment Legislation. So I'm going to take a slightly different approach to the structure of this lecture. Remember in most of our lectures we've started with the problem and then related it to the legislation. I want to take a different approach in this lecture because the history is really valuable to understand for understanding the overall relationship between the Commonwealth and the states. So I'm going to start with the story. Stories are great. A great way of learning is to um, talk about them. So we're going to start with the story of the Tasmanian Dam case in 1983 and then we'll use that to springboard into the relationship between the Commonwealth and the states and then I'm going to look at three problems um, to explain the EPBC Act. So we'll look at mass culling of flying foxes in North Queensland, uh, a big coal project and a big dam. So three problems um, and we'll use that yeah, just to explore the EPBC Act. Um, remember to keep the importance of the EPBC Act in perspective. There's only about 100 to 400 referrals or projects that are given to the Commonwealth each year to assess. In contrast, there's about a quarter of a million projects assessed under state planning laws. So as I've said, uh, the bulk of your work in professional practice involves the planning system at a state level. That's where you know, people will pay you as a town planner or environmental consultant to prepare a report because they, you know, they want to build a hotel or something, they need approval uh, under, from the local government and they basically have to go through that process so they pay you to prepare it for them. And you know from the group assignment the incredible amount of work involved in doing those things. Often the reports that you prepare at a state level you can just basically attach them to a Commonwealth referral if you think that the EPBC Act might be relevant. But most people don't make referrals under the EPBC Act. It's mainly big projects that have referrals or something's in a significant uh, or particularly sensitive area. Still, it's important to be aware of the Act because it's a sort of like a landmine that can go off. You don't want to have a project that you've advised your client about the state level processes and you spend several years getting that only to work out when you're about to, you know, the bulldozers are about to start clearing the property um, that actually there's significant Commonwealth issues and you forgot or didn't, you didn't think about the need for a referral and that can create the EPB stack normally isn't a problem unless you forget about it. Um, so um, that's a key thing I want to emphasise. Be aware of it. Um, and a key point about it is projects are very rarely refused under the Act, but it still plays an important role, particularly as a check on large state infrastructure projects. So if the state government proposes a big dam or some other big project, normally the state level assessment is useless because um, if it's a state government project it just gets tick 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 by the other state government departments you know with a little bit of bells and whistles thrown in to make it look like it's not obviously just um, a foregone conclusion but basically you never get refused at a state level if you're a state project. Um, so the Commonwealth at least stands apart from that and normally they tick things off I wouldn't say that they you know often stand in the way of major projects but still important that there's this independent um, from big state government projects, uh, independent assessment. But let's start with a story, the story of the Tasmanian Dam case in 1983. And I'm going to play you a little bit of um, footage from uh, the, from a documentary about the, um, this litigation. For flows through a remote wilderness in the southwest corner of Tasmania. For thousands of years, it had remained untouched. In the early 1980s, the Franklin became known to millions of Australians. 
the Tasmanian government had plans to dam the river. It was to be part of a massive hydroelectric scheme. But in 1983, these plans came to an abrupt halt. The High Court of Australia stopped the project after the biggest environmental battle Australians had ever seen. The fight for the Franklin would be a turning point for Australia's conservation movement. Preserving the environment became a national cause. The fight over the Franklin River was between two groups with very different opinions, the conservation movement and the Tasmanian government. While the government planned to dam the river for a hydroelectric scheme, the conservationists wanted the Franklin to remain undeveloped, and both sides strongly believed they were right. Let's take a closer look at the two groups. What caused their dramatic confrontation on the river, and how had this conflict of values come about? On one side was the Tasmanian government and its hydroelectric commission. The hydro, as Tasmanians called it, was responsible for building dams and power stations for the government. As the state's largest employer, it was an important organisation. For almost a century, the hydro helped Tasmania's economy to grow. The dams and power stations the hydro built enabled the government to provide industries with cheap electricity. The huge amounts of power these industries consumed provided the Tasmanian economy with a healthy income. To the Tasmanian government, the development of hydroelectric schemes meant progress. The Hydro was a powerful and influential organisation. By 1970, there were already 40 dams dotted across the state. The Hydro had built dams on every major river in Tasmania, except the Franklin. And now, it wanted one there too. But it wasn't just the government and the Hydro who wanted another power station. Many Tasmanians also supported the plan. More dams meant more jobs in a state which suffered the highest rate of unemployment in Australia. Jobs weren't the only argument for another hydroelectric scheme. The hydro predicted that if a dam wasn't built, Tasmanians would face a severe power shortage in the next 10 years. We're providing for 10 years ahead, and uh, surely it's not the right thing to do to condemn people to having to live in a uh, depressed uh, manner with their energy supplies through failing to build what looks to be necessary 10 years ahead now. Pitted against the economic will of the Tasmanian government and the hydro was a small group of conservationists. Members of the Tasmanian Wilderness Society were concerned about the hydro scheme and its destructive effect on the environment. They argued that if the plan for a dam went ahead, the Franklin River and the ancient forests around it would disappear under a flood of water. OK, I'm going to fast forward. And we won't to what happened uh, because there was a political uh, step. Yep. Jump over the down. Walking through the streets of Melbourne. It was the biggest environmental rally in the country's history. Not since the Vietnam War protests of the 1960s had Melbourne seen such a dramatic expression of public opinion. In January 1983, less than a month after the blockade on the river had begun, a federal election was suddenly announced. How would this affect the conflict over the dam? Customers circulate in Diamond Valley? Well, there has been... The headquarters for the political battle is the society's office in Melbourne. The main aim is simply to tip out of office government members in 13 key mainland marginal seats. That, in effect, means votes for Labor. Stopping the dam became one of the Labor Party's main election promises. 
Its leader, Bob Hawke, campaigned for votes at rallies organised by the Wilderness Society. I'd like you to give a very warm welcome to Bob Hawke, who, with your help, will be the next Prime Minister of Australia. It's great to be here on the platform uh, with such people as uh, Bob Brown, who I regard as one of the great Australians. If we meet the requirements in regard to power and jobs, then there remains no reason at all for a dam that no one wants as a dam. I want to say unequivocally because apparently there has been some attempt to suggest that our position is not clear. I say to you that when Labor comes into government after the 5th of March, the dam will not proceed. The Labor Party went on to win the 1983 election. Bob Hawke was the new Prime Minister. But the majority of Tasmanians hadn't voted for his party. Work on the dam continued as if nothing had happened. The Tasmanian government and the hydro simply refused to give in. The future of the dam on the Franklin is in doubt. This film was shot three days after Mr Hawke's announcement that the dam would not be built. And down below, the work is clearly going ahead as if nothing's changed in Canberra. Remember that before the federal election, the Labor Party promised to stop the Tasmanian dam. So how did it go about fulfilling that promise once it was elected? Well, what the federal Labor government did was to pass a new law. It was called the World Heritage Properties Conservation Act. Under this law, the federal government had complete control over all World Heritage areas in the country. But determined to fight on, the Tasmanian government challenged the new law. And that raised the question of who had the power over southwest Tasmania. The federal government or the state government? This was a constitutional question that had to be decided in court. The High Court in Brisbane has ruled that the Gordon Below Franklin Dam cannot be built. In July 1983, the High Court of Australia made its decision. The power over the Franklin rested with the federal government. OK, we'll pause it there. And that nice historic footage. Doesn't everyone um, in that look really like you probably know Bob Brown? And he looks very old now. He looks much younger in that when he was a young whippersnapper. And Bob Hawke too. OK, so that's a background to this important court case. Um, this is a picture that was iconic um, during that campaign. It's called Rock Island Bend. It was a picture by Peter Drums Dombrowski. Uh, and it was used on a poster uh, by the Wilderness Society in the campaign to stop the Franklin. And it's a, arguably the most famous um, picture in Australian environmental history. So it's taken on the Franklin River. So just to um, locate where we're um, looking at. So Tasmania, as you know, big island down the um, south of, Ta of Australia. Um, got beautiful walking in the southwest of um, Tasmania. Um, best walking, I think, in in Australia, um, if you're a keen bushwalker. Okay, so the location of the dam was proposed on the west coast. So if we focus in on that, there had been, as you saw in the film clip of the documentary, there'd been a number of dams built um, by the Tasmanian Hydroelectric Commission prior to the um, proposed Gordon Below Franklin. The biggest of those was the um, uh, Gordon River Dam, which had dammed um, the Gordon River uh, and created Lake Gordon and Lake Pedder. Lake Pedder, and this was built in the um, late 1960s, early 1970s, and it led to the flooding of this beautiful um, Lake Pedder, which uh, is often regarded as the um, foundation for the modern Australian environmental movement because environmentalists were so horrified by the destruction of this beautiful area that it really galvanised them so that when the um, New Dam was proposed in the early 1980s, there was already this festering um, discontent with the situation where these beautiful places could be destroyed. And that really primed 
the community for the massive fight over the proposed dam. So this um, new proposed dam was downstream of the um, Gordon. So the um, Gordon River Dam was basically a little bit off this image and the Gordon River flows in from the south. The Franklin River flows in from the north and they join uh, and the dam was proposed just beneath the junction. So the dam is often called the Gordon Below Franklin Dam um, or it's often simply called the Franklin Dam on the Franklin River. Um, and the rivers then flow out to the west coast of um, Tasmania. So that's where the dam was proposed, just there. So um, this is a map. Uh, I, a few years ago I approached the High Court for some of the evidence that was used in the court case. And so this was a map that was presented by the Commonwealth uh, in the court case to show um, where the... So here's the location of the dam and here's the Franklin River flowing south. Rock Island Bend, that famous picture, is actually way upstream from where the dam was proposed, but it would have been flooded by basically the um, dam reservoir. This is an image um, which the research assistant who I had go into the um, High Court registry and get these um, pictures for me. You can see the wine glasses um, around it. So you get an idea how big it is. Um, just think that this um, was used as evidence in this court case back in 1983. So back in 1983, so pre-internet, pre, you know, ready use of satellite imagery and the like, you know, Google Earth was, you know, not even a glimmer in someone's mind at that point. Um, uh, getting good imagery was actually hard back in 1983. So what the Commonwealth did was get, um, when Bob Hawke was elected, they got a um, Australian Air Force uh, F-111 to fly down and take pictures. So they had an aerial reconnaissance from um, a federal or Commonwealth jet, basically of state government activity. Um, and they took these pictures and you can see it must have been massive in its day, like it, well it's still big, you know, it's basically a metre across. This big image of showing um, basically where the dam was being built. You can see the road going in. Um, I happened to find that image um, on a website and it's um, uh, it, at the Australian National University where I teach a course um, on environmental litigation. It hangs um, in the staff um, common room and it was, it's been framed with pictures of all of the members of the High Court that decided the case's signature on it uh, and it, the caption to the picture explains the story. Um, in the Franklin Dam case, um, Sorry, the Franklin Dam case was one of the most momentous decisions of the High Court in the history of the Australian constitutional law. By a majority of four to three, the High Court held that basically the Commonwealth could protect the river. Um, it was preceded by a tumultuous period of protest demonstrations and civil disobedience. In a celebrated incident dubbed by the media as a spy flight, this photograph was taken in early 1983 from a Royal Australian Air Force F-111 under instruction from Attorney General Attorney General Gareth Evans, who in turn was dubbed irrelevantly by the media as the fictitious um, Cavalier Air Ace Biggles um, and was tendered in evidence by the Commonwealth. The signatures on the photograph of the seven High Court judges uh, and were obtained by um, a member of an, uh, a graduate of ANU who was an um, associate to them at the time. Um, the High Court Registry also gave us some of the pictures, other pictures that have been taken. This one is showing a work area, which you saw in that little bit of footage as well, a road going in, um, so the construction for the dam, more of the road, uh, and this is the point where basically some of the loading was going on. Um, this isn't taken from the RF. I just got this off Google Earth, just showing the junction between the um, Franklin River coming in there from the right and the Gordon River and where they flow around. So this is a sort of area that would have been flooded. Uh, and this is um, just a random picture taken from Google Earth um, from that area, uh, just because it's, I just threw it in because it's such a gorgeous picture. Um, and I love walking in these sorts of areas, it's sort of all covered in moss and you sort of look around and you think if, like, if, um, if there's any fairies, they live in these places. <laughs> um, just to contrast it, this is the Gordon River Dam that was built in 1969 to 1974. So massive high dam. 
and massive um, area that was flooded behind it. Here's just a couple of pictures of protesters. 1982, there's a massive um, blockade of protesters came from all around Australia, uh, went down to um, Tasmania, and this is a protest um, in Hobart in 1981, so a couple of years before the election. So it was building for years before um, the election. So um, Bob Hawke was elected, passed some laws saying basically the um, you couldn't um, damage uh, anything or do anything within a World Heritage Area uh, without the Commonwealth's approval, and they weren't going to give approval for this dam. The state government, the Tasmanian government, challenged that and said that the law was unconstitutional, that the Commonwealth didn't have the power to make that law. It went immediately to the High Court because it was this massive constitutional case, and like normally it takes years for a case to get to the High Court. This case, I think, started in March of 1983 and was decided in July of 1983, and it actually takes up about 300 pages of judgment. It's an entire volume of the Commonwealth Law Reports. Um, so they basically heard it and decided it within three months. And the key issues involved the Commonwealth Constitution. So if we rewind back to um, Federation for Australia in 1901, Prior to Federation, Australia was made up of a series of um, colonies um, from the United Kingdom um, and um, each of those colonies, New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia and the like, decided to come together and form um, a single nation which would still have the um, Queen of England as the Queen of Australia. Uh, I think it might have been the King at that time, but it would have been the King at that time, but anyway. Um, the monarch in England is still the monarch of Australia. And when they formed um, together, so they, instead of being individual colonies, they formed a nation and they created a national government to govern them all. Something like the Lord of the Rings with you know, <laughs> one ring to rule them all or something. Anyway, the one ring to rule them all was the Commonwealth Constitution. So this was created... And what it did was create the federal government and it also gave the federal government certain powers because the state governments didn't want to give up all of their power. The real drivers for forming <coughs> Australia as a nation were two main things. One was defence, um, so the threat of invasion by you know, um, some other country and the, the need for a national defence and also freedom of trade between the colonies. They were the two main drivers. Uh, but then a certain number of powers were given to the Commonwealth Government to make laws in respect of, and they're contained in Section 51 of the Constitution. The main ones that are relevant to environmental issues um, I've listed here. So we've got trade and commerce with other countries. So if someone wants to sell something outside Australia um, and or within the States, the Commonwealth can regulate it, and the Commonwealth used that power to restrict, for instance, um, sale of sand from, say, Fraser Island um, when they wanted to stop sand mining on Fraser Island in the 70s. So that sort of power can be used. Um, taxation. Um, the Commonwealth has power to make taxes, and they can be for any purpose. So, like the carbon tax, when it was created by the Gillard government, it was, was a valid law of the Commonwealth, simply under the taxa taxation power. Um, quarantine, um, fisheries, um, foreign corporations, uh, 5120 is another important one. So if it's a foreign corporation or a trading or financial corporation, um, then the Commonwealth can make laws in respect of them. That's important because most things that damage the environment now are done by corporations, like individuals like you and me. We only have small-scale impacts. Any big enterprise in our modern society is going to be forming formed as a corporation. So the Commonwealth can regulate them because they're corporations. But the big um, fight in the Tasmanian Dam case was about the um, 29th um, of the listed powers, external affairs. So the Constitution basically reads, the Commonwealth, um, the Commonwealth Parliament shall have power to make laws for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to external affairs. So what does external affairs mean? Um, the, back in 1901 when the Constitution was formed, you know, issues about environment, climate change, all that sort of stuff obviously wasn't a concern. 
were not as big a concern. Um, whatever was meant by external affairs, it had to be interpreted as just basically part of the text of the Constitution. And one of the key things that had, you know, obviously the world had moved on since 1901. One of the key things that the Commonwealth had been um, able to do, which it didn't have a power over in the 1930s, was make laws with respect to aviation. Because back in 1901, there weren't even any planes. When, when planes started to fly around, it made sense to have national laws about aviation rules and aviation safety because you don't really want to get to the border and have to fly like on the different side of planes coming towards you. Um, so there was a national framework for aviation laws uh, which relied upon an international treaty about... Um, and so it made sense to have things linked to international agreements that the Commonwealth could make laws in respect of. So the Commonwealth had agreed to the World Heritage um, convention when it was created in the early 1970s. So it had been around for a decade and the argument that the Commonwealth put forward was that it could make laws under the external affairs power simply to fulfil its international legal obligations. Um, and it's a peculiar aspect of Australian, Australia's national laws that our Commonwealth government has this power linked to external affairs. It's different in other countries. If you're from China or the US, you have different constitutional arrangements. But this is a really significant part of um, our framework in Australia. And basically the um, High Court held that the Commonwealth um, had power. It, it was, um, in the Tasmanian Dam case, that was the seminal case, but it was then there was a series of later cases that um, basically affirmed it and locked it in. So it's now just an accepted part of Australian constitutional law that the Commonwealth has power to enact legislation that is reasonably capable of being considered appropriate and adapted to fulfil Australia's international legal obligations. Now, if you th think about that, have a look at... Um, on. I've given you a handout. which has got um, a summary of the EPBC Act on one page. But if you turn over, I've just given you a page out of my synopsis book, uh, and it summarises the main constitutional rules, including in that paragraph basically that test. Um, and it's, it's significant to understand those relationships between... Um, uh, levels of government in Australia if you're working in the system because it's often assumed by state governments in particular that um, they still take the view that the Commonwealth doesn't have a legitimate role in relation to protecting the environment. And constitutional um, writers talk about there's this big difference between the assumed constitution and the real constitution. The real constitution doesn't have, basically doesn't reserve to the states the power to regulate activities over the environment. The Commonwealth actually has massive powers to regulate those activities. In practice, it's mainly the states that still do it, but that's really a historic artefact. The Commonwealth could do a lot more if it wanted to, but basically since the big fight in the 1980s, the Commonwealth has pretty well retreated to doing, not being too adventurous, not taking on the states too much, and leaving the states to basically manage most of the environmental issues with Commonwealth acting as in an oversight role. So anyway, that handout gives you um, a summary of the main um, constitutional um, arrangements that arose out of um, that case. So that's the main rule. Um, a key thing to understand is because of the width of Australia's international legal ob obligations, this gives the Commonwealth a very wide power to make laws to protect the environment. And I give the example on the handout of um, Article 8 of the Biodiversity Convention. So Australia is a party to the Biodiversity Convention and it basically requires, us, uh, requires Australia to conserve biodiversity both within and outside of protected areas. And so if you look at something like D, Article 8D, Australia has an obligation to promote the protection of ecosystems, natural habitats and the maintenance of viable populations of species in natural surroundings. 
that's the international obligation. A Commonwealth law will be valid if it's reasonably capable of being considered appropriate and adapted to fulfil that obligation. So it's a very wide obligation. It's a very, well, I wouldn't say very, it's a quite a lenient test for the linkage between them that's required. So the Commonwealth has very broad powers. Um, it generally doesn't use them. Uh, it generally leaves things to the states. A key other thing to understand, and the final key constitutional thing to understand is um, under section 109 of the Australian Constitution, if there's a valid law of the Commonwealth, it overrides state laws to the extent of inconsistency. So that was why in the Tasmanian Dam case, the state government wanted to build it, the Commonwealth government didn't want it built, the Commonwealth government won because basically its laws in our system can override state laws. So even though the state had passed laws saying this dam can be built, they were inconsistent with the Commonwealth laws which prevented it. Don't get too hung up on inconsistency. In practice, it's very rarely um, the case that you'll find inconsistent laws. Normally, um, most laws operate side by side and you need approvals under both. So if you're acting for someone and they want to build a hotel or some big resort somewhere, you basically have to get approval at a state level and you have to get approval at a Commonwealth level for it. And um, if you don't get approval at both of those levels, and including the local government in the state level, if you don't get approval from both of those, then you can't proceed with the project. It's basically you'll be committing an offence against one of those, you know, either state or Commonwealth laws. So you need all relevant approvals is the basic thing um, that you need to understand for operating in the system. Um, as I said, section 109 creates this hierarchy of Commonwealth laws overriding state, but don't get hung up on that because it's very rarely the case in practice. Normally they operate side by side. Um, the centrepiece now of Commonwealth environment laws is the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which I'll call the EPBC Act for short. And you might ask yourself, well, why is it such a long name? Um, the, why is it called Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation? What do you think is the difference between Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation? Anyone got any suggestions? Uh, the protection might be in relation to controlling development and the um, conservation might be in relation to preserving what's already, you know, preserving that's a good blind stab in the dark, um, um, but you'll find when you actually look at it that the environment protection sections of the um, legislation also include protection of things like threatened species. Uh, and if you look at the definition of environment, it includes species. So what's the difference? I'm being cruel. Really, there is no difference. When they came up with the title to this act, they really just wanted to um, give it pretty well every feel-good word that you could think of um, and also distinguish it because a lot of states had Environment Protection Acts and they just wanted to be different. So they threw in a few extra words just to be different. That is ultimately the only rationale for the title. Um, so this legislation sits, we've talked about this hierarchy, we've got international law, Commonwealth, Queensland and the common law. Uh, in this hierarchy we've talked about in earlier lectures, and you see now why I put environment, sorry, international law at the top, because it feeds into our system because of section 5129 of the um, of our con Australian constitution. It is an important link between international law and the powers of the Commonwealth to make laws to protect the environment, because there's no specific power in the Commonwealth Constitution that says the Commonwealth can make laws to protect the environment. It's got to rely upon those other heads of power. It's actually quite similar to, if you look at, say, the US Constitution, there's no specific power to the US federal government to make laws to protect the environment, yet they've made laws like the Endangered Species Act, the National Environment Protection Act, Policy Act of 1969, most of them made in Richard Nixon's um, tenure. 
uh, and the Clean Waters Act. So all of those um, laws rely particularly upon interstate um, commerce provisions as well. This, the US Constitution is quite limited um, for uh, federal um, powers, but all of those environment laws at a federal level rely upon these sort of indirect hooks. Um, so, um, and we've still got all of these state laws underneath it, which, as I say, um, Commonwealth laws override state laws to the extent of inconsistency, hence this hierarchy going down of Commonwealth on top of st the state laws. Okay, let's look at a few problems um, involving the EPBC Act to try and flesh out how it operates. So I want to tell you about um, a court case I was involved in um, about 15 years ago. Um, call it, I call it the Flying Fox case. Uh, it's on my website if you want to have a look at it. Basically, this uh, case involved the mass killing of um, flying foxes called a species called spectacle flying foxes. Now, um, they're called spectacles because they've got a gold tuft of fur around their eyes, which look like they're wearing a pair of um, glasses or spectacles. So you can see the spectacle flying fox here. Can you see the gold ring around their eyes? Mm -hmm. um, and then they've typically got a gold tuft of fur around their shoulders as well. If you see a flying fox um, here in Brisbane, um, you, it won't be a spectacle flying fox. The spectacle flying foxes are endemic to North Queensland in the rainforests up there. So if you go up to Cairns and you see a big flying fox flying overhead, quite likely it's a spectacle flying fox. Down here it's going to be um, either a grey-headed flying fox or a common um, black flying fox or something like that, um, or a little red. There's four species of flying foxes um, in Queensland. Um, so flying foxes, you know, um, you, uh, I presume you know, there's two main groups of bats. There's the little bats called the microchioptera and they eat insects and the like. So they're your classic ones that you know we all know about with their you know, big ears and um, able to work things out with their great sort of um, hearing. They eat little things. Um, and then there's the big bats, um, or the megachioptera, which um, don't just eat insects. They eat um, fruit, they eat um, blossom, um, they eat um, buds of plants and the like. Um, so they're basically vegetarians, they're not, um, you know, you, some people don't like bats because they think that they're blood sucking. Um, big bats aren't, they're vegetarians. Um, and so this bat is actually um, feeding on the blossom and nectar in this um, eucalyptus tree. Uh, and it's been snapped and, you know, obviously looking at the photographer thinking, what the hell are you doing? Um, and uh, so just like... Um, uh, you know, bees sort of fly around from flower to flower and get pollen on them and then fly to the next flower, deposit flower, sorry, deposit pollen on the next flower and so pollinate. Everyone knows that. Um, you mightn't be aware that flying foxes perform exactly the same role for a lot of plant species. Um, this flying fox, in feeding on the um, flowers, would be getting covered in pollen at the same time on its fur. It then flies off to another tree that's in flower at the same time, same species in flower, uh, in the rainforest. And when it feeds on the next plant, it pollen gets spread all around and it pollinates um, those trees. Um, apart from pollination, they're also really important for seed dispersal because basically any um, large pungent fruit that hangs from a tree and is yet yeah, smelly uh, is a classic flying fox dispersed um, fruit. Um, basically, fruits, um, you know, smelly fruits are. Everyone, does everyone know what, you know, what's the fruit from a. What is a fruit from a plant's perspective? What's it doing? Why does a plant have a fruit? Attractive. To attract? Think of like a mango, okay? So you've got like a big mango hanging on a tree, um, you've got the flesh around the side that you know you eat and it's really yummy or similarly a lychee so you know you've got the flesh around the side and then in the middle of those there's the hard seed that you don't eat like the mango there's that big pip and in a lychee you've got the you know the significant seed and you normally just throw them away so what's the flesh around the seed from the plant's perspective to attract 
it's not actually needed for reproduction, is it? Because the seed in the middle is actually what the plant needs for reproducing you know, like its next plant. The flesh around it is really just a bribe to a mammal to come and eat it and disperse its seed. So your classic apple or um, mango, um, basically plants have got us worked out as mammals. They've created these little packages and it basically says, come and take my seed, and take me somewhere else and hopefully disperse me. That's basically what's going on. Uh, so uh, I think that's quite funny. If you next time you bite into an apple, I'd like you to just reflect upon <laughs> the fact that are you actually um, the winner in this relationship or is the, is the apple taking you for a ride? Because um, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, apples have got us worked out. Not only do we disperse their seed, but we get in and actually clear whole other ecosystems plant their trees in nice rows, put insecticides on them, water them, you know, move them all around the planet. By giving us this little bit of flesh in a, you know, in a fruit, apples have been remarkably successful in taming us as a species. So um, reflect on that next time you bite a fruit, how that plant is taking you for a ride. I, think, I want you to be angry. I want you to be angry at that plant. Okay. Focusing on the flying fox, um, they disperse a lot of um, fruits. So anything that's smelly hanging from a tree is a classic mammal dispersed, particularly flying foxes. So lychees, mangoes, all of these things are actually, it's the tree trying to attract in um, a mammal, particularly a flying fox. Um, the smell, um, flying foxes actually don't have much better hearing than us. They have really good eyesight. Um, but the microcopter are the ones that have the really good echolocation sort of stuff. Flying foxes rely on eyesight and smell. So you can see its big nostrils, got really good sense of smell. So they can smell a ripe fruit from a long way away. So they're attracted into a, a plant, they take the fruit, they might fly, for it, fly with it um, and drop it. You know, they eat it as they fly and drop it. Um, or it might pass through, they might eat it, and the seed passes through their digestive system and passes out the end. Um, somewhere other than where the plant um, that gave it this, the fruit um, was located. Okay, so um, spectacle flying foxes are endemic to the um, rainforests, so, uh, and they are particularly um, in around Cairns. Most of the rainforests around Cairns are now part of the wet tropics World Heritage Area of North Queensland. Um, so this is a satellite image of the wet tropics. I'm going to focus in on where that red circle is. This is where a lychee farm was, um, uh, had constructed something to kill um, flying foxes. So focusing in on that, um, there's a lychee orchard. The yellow outline is basically the World Heritage Area. And then uh, all this area up here is the Tully floodplain. It's all been cleared for sugarcane. Um, all the area pretty well in the World Heritage Area is all the high country, the coastal um, mountain area that couldn't be cleared for farming because it was too steep. So it's basically now been packaged into um, national parks and World Heritage Areas. Um, this is the Bruce Highway is just here. And the farm was located, you can see how they're pretty well cleared into what would have been rainforest. And they planted this um, massive, it was the biggest lychee farm in North Queensland. Um, and this isn't the lychee farm, this is another one. Um, this was a fellow, Dick Yardley, and this is a picture taken of him. Um, what the farms had done in that area was because flying, you know, they planted lychee crops and mango crops and the like, and bloody hell, flying foxes like to come and eat those things. So the farmers didn't like that. So um, many of them, um, particularly in the 80s, erected a thing which was called um, colloquially a fry fox. Um, and you can see it here. It's basically got wires that are strung between poles. The wires are electrified so that when flying foxes come in at night to feed, um, they, collide, they can't see the wires, they collide with it and are electrocuted. Um, a, a conservationist back in 2000 named Cara Booth um, got a tip off that there was a farm that was killing thousands of flying foxes. She didn't actually believe that that could possibly be true, that anyone could be killing thousands of flying foxes. But she went out with um, some colleagues to check it out. Uh, and they went at night time to the farm 
um, because the farmer wouldn't have been too happy about them being there. Um, but they also felt that they needed to gather evidence because the um, regulator, the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, they thought was unlikely to want to take on a farmer. So they wanted to basically find out, gather evidence. Um, so they, it was a lychee farm, everyone knows lychees, beautiful fruit. I'm going to show you some raw footage of the flying foxes um, being killed in this farm. It's taken by um, Carol Booth. Um, so um, this is early in the morning. Um, this is a dead spectacle flying fox. It's quite a freshly killed one. Um, this is one hanging up in the wires. So you can see the electric grids there. There were 13 wires. Um, and you can see it's early in the morning. You can see the dead flying foxes hanging up. So they located um, across this farm, I think it was 12, 12 of these grids, a total of 6.4 kilometres of electric grids. Um, and they worked out that the farmers were killing, because you can see the number of dead bats just hanging up in the wires, and they cleared them each um, day. Uh, here's a more um, decomposed one. Here's a very recently killed one. And then the next one. At this time of year, flying foxes fly with their young. So this one, the mother has been killed and is dead, and it's a little baby flying fox that's actually would have been clinging to its mother and wasn't electrocuted. But the mother's fallen to the ground and the little baby's stuck on it. Um, so lots of dead bats hanging up there. Uh, and there's, here's a bit of caribou. Oops, sorry. She found and had fallen off and so we were able to pick this little baby up from her. I hate to imagine what it happens to the other babies. They must just hang houses all day even until they die or the farmer takes them down and who knows what he does with the babies that are still alive. Mm -hmm. So this one will probably do quite well. He's quite, quite big and strong and assertive as you can see. He's already had a feed. He's one of the lucky ones. And they walked around at night time. This is on night cam. And I could go forward to a point where one gets electrocuted. They actually get footage of one being electrocuted. It's really terrible. It just screams as it's electrocuted. I won't do that. Um, so, um, Carol... Um, oh, that's very dark, isn't it? Okay, let's just um, set the story here, set the story right. So um, Carol had this footage. She walked around. She found that on the 6.4 kilometres of grids, the farmers were killing between 300 and 500 flying foxes each night. <coughs> she went um, to the... Um, state government regulator with this information and the footage. Um, the regulator and the, the spectacle flying foxes are a protected animal under the Nature Conservation Act that we've talked about in earlier lectures. So killing them without a damage mitigation permit under the Nature Conservation Regulations was an offence at the time. The farmer didn't have one, but the QPWS, um, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, responded by going out to the farm and issuing the farmer with a retrospective permit to take 500 um, uh, flying foxes um, across the season. The lychee season lasts pretty well for about six to eight weeks in December, January. So if you work it out, um, this farm, if you think every, if it was killing 300 to 500 per night, it was killing somewhere between 10 and 30,000 flying foxes um, across the lychee season if the rate was constant. Um, there was information that the entire species of spectacle flying foxes in the wet tropics was about 100,000. Um, flying foxes are slow to reproduce. They only have one, one, young, one or two young per year. So they are not quick to reproduce from mass mortality. So you've got 100,000 in the entire wet tropics. This one farm could be killing between 10 and 30,000 of them in one um, season. 
the state regulator responds by going and giving them a permit. Um, now, Cara responded by saying, I don't think you've even got power to issue a retrospective permit, but even if you do, this guy is killing more than the permit every night or every second night, because the permit was for 500 flying foxes. Um, he was killing way more than that, but they refused to take any action. So she looked around, and at a state level at that time, she couldn't sue under the State Nature Conservation Act because she didn't have a legal right to do it. So she looked at the Commonwealth EPBC Act, and we went off to the federal court. Um, the reason why she, the EPBC Act was relevant was the flying foxes weren't listed as a threatened species at the time, <coughs> but the flying foxes were endemic to the wet tropics world heritage area, the rainforest. So we argued that killing the flying foxes was an offence against the Commonwealth Act because of the impacts on the wet, wet tropics world heritage area. So the wet tropics is listed under the World Heritage Convention in 1988. Um, it's listed for a range of um, reasons, but particularly it's high biodiversity. It contains the most important and significant habitats where threatened species of plants and animals of outstanding universal value from the point of view of science and conservation still survive. Um, and actually in the um, documents that went to the World Heritage Committee was a picture of a spectacle flying fox. Um, so these flying foxes, spectacle, the, I mentioned before there's four big species of flying foxes in Australia, or four species. Spectacle flying foxes are in basically that black band at the top. Um, we don't get them around Brisbane. Um, just before you think, what was poor farmer, they're having all their fruit um, destroyed by these flying foxes. Um, a sensible farmer actually nets the crop um, because you know, basically it um, stops the flying foxes being able to get to it. So netting you'll see um, around fruit farms, it's really common. Um, and it would have been far more cost effective for the farmer to net their crop then erect these electric grids. So it wasn't actually necessary to protect the crop, but they were doing it. Um, so the question I want to ask is, did the killing of flying foxes break any law and could it be stopped? Might take a five minute break uh, at this point and we'll come back and we'll um, look at our other problems and then weave that into the EPBC Act. So hop up, stretch your legs um, and we will... Welcome back to the second half of our lecture. So before the break, we were talking about the first of our three problems. Uh, remember, we, we talked about the Tasmanian Dams case, laid the foundation for how the Commonwealth gets involved in environmental issues. And now we're looking at three problems that will link together to look at the Commonwealth EPBC Act. So we looked at this mass killing of flying foxes. And we got to the question, did the killing of flying foxes break any law and could it be stopped? The second problem that I want to look at before we go on to unpick the EPBC Act is a different project. Um, this is just, you know, a big project. Um, it was a proposed coal mine and rail line and court pro, um, um, coal port um, proposed by Waratah Coal out in the Galilee Basin. Uh, so that's the location of the proposed mine. Uh, actually, I'm wrong there. It wasn't the Galilee Basin. I think it might have been the western end of the... Um, Surat. Yeah, I don't think it was the Surat or the um, Bowen Basin at that point. Actually, I'm not sure if it was the Galilee Basin. Um, but basically the proposal was to build this big mine. It would. They then wanted to put in a new rail line and um, there are existing coal ports. The controversial bit wasn't the coal mine because we love coal mines in Australia. Um, but there's a big... Um, uh, coal loading facility at Mackay called Hay Point uh, and Dalrymple Point. And there's also a massive um, coal loading facility at Gladstone. And anyway, those at the time were at capacity and the company decided that they were big enough and ugly enough that they wanted their own port. So they proposed to put a coal loading facility right in between these two other major ports and build their own port and build a whole dedicated rail line so that they didn't have to be delayed by anyone else. That was basically their rationale. So it was a really big coal mine. Um, and they proposed the port was the bit that was the killer. So they wanted to put this um, new coal loading facility 
um, in a relatively undeveloped part of um, the coast. It's undeveloped because the military have had this big um, training area at Shoalwater um, Bay. It's also, though, part of a Ramsar wetland. So uh, has anyone been? I was in the Army years ago. Um, I haven't been up to Shoalwater Bay, but um, plenty of other time being bitten by mosquitoes. Um, uh, and um, has anyone been to Shoalwater Bay? No? Yes. So um, basically the military is in many ways a really good environmental manager because they've got these big areas. They like driving tanks and things around on them occasionally, so they don't like to clear them. Uh, and they're also one of the few organisations with a fair bit of money to throw around so they can implement actual management plans and, you know, they like to keep the trees so that, you know, people can run around and go, bang, bang, you're dead. Um, or, bang, bang, gotcha, you've got to count to ten. I <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> only joking. Um, so, um, it's a relatively, it's undeveloped um, and basically this company wanted to put this new coal port. Actually, it must have been, yeah, it was the Galilee. Sorry, I was... I was right the first time. Um, the mine was proposed in the Galilee Basin. Here? Jericho, right? Was Jericho? Uh, might have been near Jericho. I don't actually know off the top of my head. Um, so this project was um, basically big. They wanted to produce 25 million tonnes um, of coal per annum, which at the time was pretty big. The Carmichael mine that we're dealing with in this court case is wants to produce between 40 and 60 million tonnes. Um, but anyway, these guys wanted to go 25 million tonnes, going to 50 million tonnes per annum and, and beyond. The biggest coal mine in Queensland at the moment produces about 12 million tonnes. There's quite a few, there's about 50 mines in Queensland producing a couple of million tonnes is a lot of coal. The biggest one's about 12. So you can see this is going big. All the Galilee mines are basically supersized or mega mines, go well beyond anything that's previously been um, in Queensland. So they had, at the time, when coal was quite high, um, uh, they had, you know, like about $390 billion worth of resource in gross value. Um, if you dug that up and burnt it, it would be about 7.8 billion tonnes of um, emissions, so equivalent to about 14 years of Australian um, emissions, three months of entire emissions from the globe. So you're talking about a big project. Um, so this was the mine proposal, Artist Impression. Um, this was the port proposal, so um, they basically wanted to have this um, stockpiles here and then build a um, jetty out and have ships coming in. So that was the proposal. You can see here a map from their um, referral under the EPPC Act, the, the rail line coming in, and then the red um, shape is the military training area, and then the green shading is the Ramsar wetland. I'll explain what Ramsar wetlands are in, in a bit, but basically it's an international internationally recognised um, uh, wetland uh, under the Ramsar Convention. So that was their proposal. Here's just a shot from Google Earth um, in the military training area. Um, so it's relatively undeveloped um, and difficult to access unless you're in the military or you've got a yacht. So um, lovely area. Um, this is coastline, about as close as I could find a picture about where they wanted to build the coal terminal out from. Um, so, again, I ask the question, did the, does a project like this need approval under the EPBC Act? And if so, how does the approval process operate and is approval likely to be given? I'll come back to that, though. I want to just have a third problem that we deal with simultaneously. So, this was a proposal by the state government to build a big dam. It was proposed a few years ago called the Traveston Crossing Dam. And... This is basically where the dam was proposed to be built. You might look at that and think, that doesn't look like a really good spot for a dam. Um, you'd be right. Uh, so the dam was proposed um, here, north of Brisbane, and it's on the Mary River, which flows down through Maryborough and out into the Great Sandy Strait between Fraser Island and um, the mainland. Um, again, the Great Sandy Strait is a Ramsar wetland, and there's a whole heap of threatened species in the river, such as, remember last week we talked about water and talked about the um, lungfish, um, which is located on the Mary River just to the north, flowing out at Bundaberg. Remember we talked about that last week? So the lungfish, the, the two endemic populations 
um, that are believed to be only on the um, Burnett River and on the Mary River. So when this was proposed, it, it was another big dam that was proposed to go in in core lungfish habitat. So a lot of concerns about it. This is an artist's impression of the proposed Travis and Crossing Dam. And remember last week, um, I think I said during the lecture, the reason why there was litigation about the Paradise Dam wasn't so much the conservationists believed that they could fix the Paradise Dam, it was because the proponent of this dam was using Paradise as an example of having a state-of-the-art fishway that would solve the fish passage problems. And basically the case was brought to really um, say that that was wrong and to show that clearly to the Commonwealth Environment Minister. Okay, so um, Mary River is one of only two river systems with the endemic um, Australian lungfish, endemic populations. It also has a whole range of other cool um, species. This is the Mary River turtle. Um, and here is a Mary River turtle with an afro. <laughs> Isn't that just a cool picture? <laughs> yes, Craig Warhurst. Um. So, all those um, animals in the river, they're listed as threatened species. Um, does the project need approval under the EPBC Act? If so, how does the approval process operate and is approval likely to be given? Let's keep that as in our mind. So let's have a look at the EPBC Act. Um, I've given you a handout with um, just an overview of... So on one side it's got the Constitution, on the other it's got um, a summary of the EPBC Act um, and how it's structured. It's got basically environment protection, it's got a list of, I'll explain, matters of national environmental significance which are listed there, and then I'll explain the referral process um, with the slides. Okay, so keep that in mind. So basically the EPBC Act is set up to create a series of triggers uh, and if you're proposing to do something that triggers the Act, then you need to make a referral and get approval under the Act. So one of the triggers is for World Heritage, and the structure of it is this. A person, including a company, must not take an action that has or will have a significant impact on the World Heritage values of a declared World Heritage property, or is likely to have a significant impact on the World Heritage values of a declared World Heritage property. So you could unpack that into you know, what that means. Action means basically any physical activity or series of activities. So the operation of the electric grids was an action. The um, building of the um, coal mine, the construction of the rail line, the construction of the coal port was an action. Uh, also the um, building of this dam and the operation of it, they're all actions. Um, person includes a company, includes a government as well. So if a local government proposes to do it, state government proposes to do it, they're all, if you, if you went into the definition of what is a person, you'd find that it includes all of those things. Um, and then what is a significant impact? Um, what, is, what are the World Heritage Values? What is a declared World Heritage property? Let's come back to that. As another example, another of the triggers is about Ramsar wetlands. Similar structure. A person must not take an action that has or will have a significant impact on the ecological character of a declared Ramsar wetland. And then there's significant fines for doing that without approval. So the Act creates nine triggers um, for things that are called matters of national environmental significance. And they're listed on your handout. You don't have to write this list down, it's on your handout. So World Heritage Places, National Heritage Places, Ramsar Wetlands, Listed Threatened Species and Listed Threatened Ecological Communities, Migratory Species, Nuclear Actions, Commonwealth Marine Areas, Great Barrier Reef and Mines and Coal Seam Gas impacting on water resources. So let's just unpick them a little bit and see what, you know, where those things are, if you can locate them geographically. So um, World Heritage. There's five World Heritage properties in Queensland. Everyone knows the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, you know the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area as well. Um, did you know that Fraser Island is a World Heritage Area? So most people know that. Um, what about the Gondwana Rainforests of Australia? Anyone heard of that one? 
So that's basically, if you go down to Lamington National Park, you're in the Gondwana rainforests of Australia. It's, it's this mosaic of remnant rainforest in southern Queensland and northern New South Wales. A whole heap of national parks were stitched together. So if you go to Lamington, um, Binnaburra, those sorts of places, you're walking in a World Heritage Area. Uh, and they're listed as World Heritage because of their high biodiversity values and links back to the supercontinent of Gondwana, um, where a lot of um, the species originated. There's also um, the uh, Australian fossil mammal sites out at Riversley uh, as well, so five. Um, what about national heritage? What the hell is that? Well, um, there's a lot of overlap between these triggers. Um, I've just got ten here, but you'd basically have to look up the national heritage list. Um, they sort of, um, some of them like the Australian fossil mammal sites at Riversley, that's also World Heritage. But then the Dinosaur Stampede National Monument at Lark Quarry, did anyone know that there had been a dinosaur um, stampede at Lark Quarry? Did anyone know there's a monument to it? Well, now you do. And it's a, on the National Heritage List. Um, some springs. Um, Fraser Island, also a World Heritage Site. Glasshouse Mountains National Landscape, Gondwana and Rainforest of Australia, again, another World Heritage property. Great Barrier Reef, another World Heritage property, and it gets its own listing in, under the Matters of National Environmental Significance, so there's a lot of overlap. But then, who would have thought the Tree of Knowledge at Bar Calden, does that still, uh, is that still alive, or did yeah, someone kill it's it? Still there. It's still there, is it? Okay, well, hopefully no one kills it. <laughs> Wet Tropics, um, as well. So a lot of overlap, but basically there's this list, you can find them on the EPBCF website. The Tree of Knowledge got poison, but it's making a recovery. Okay. Oh, sorry. The Tree of Knowledge is dead. Did you see? It's still protected. Oh, okay. Well, there's a monument to the Tree of Knowledge. Okay, someone killed it. Okay. Okay. So that's national heritage. Um, there's a lot of redundancy in these. Um, Triggers, but it, if you the World Heritage is the big ones. Ramsar Wetlands is also significant, and a few of the other triggers. Ramsar Wetlands. So um, Ramsar, if you do my International Regulatory Frameworks course, we talk about the Ramsar Convention a lot. Uh, so um, back in the 1970s, um, global community recognised that um, wetlands were being, de being destroyed at an ma amazing rate and that wetlands were really important for migratory birds to be able to fly from China to Australia and you know, stop along in Indonesia. And countries agreed to protect wetlands under an international convention, which is called the Convention on the Protection of Wetlands of International Importance, especially as waterfowl habitat, which is a long name. Um, it was signed in the Iranian city of Ramsar in 1971. So everyone just calls it the Ramsar Convention for short. And wetlands listed under the convention are called Ramsar wetlands. So they are wetlands that are being recognised at an international level because of their importance for international migratory bird species. And again, there's five in Queensland. Um, Bowling Green Bay near Townsville, or just south of Townsville. Shoalwater and Corio Bays near Rockhampton, um, the one that we're... This, um, Coalport wants to be built in. Um, Great Sandy Strait in Fraser Island, which again, that the dam wants to basically interfere with a river that flows into this Ramsar wetland. Um, Moreton Bay uh, here in Brisbane is also a Ramsar wetland. So a lot of development around in southeast Queensland. If you're basically in Redland Shire or Moreton Bay Shire or Brisbane, if you're doing something that's going to potentially impact on the ecological values of Moreton Bay, you actually should be thinking about EPBC Act referrals. Um, Karawinia Lakes, um, part of the Murray-Darling as well, so five of them. So, as I said, as an example, one of them is the Shoalwater um, and Corio Bays. So Shoalwater is to the north, Corio Bay is this little one to the south, little patch. So everything pretty well in the green shading um, is um, part of the Ramsar wetland. Moreton Bay, um, as I said, is also a Ramsar wetland. Pretty well all of the green areas um, are part of the Ramsar listing for Moreton Bay. So as I say, if you're doing development around Moreton Bay, um, EPBCA can be relevant. Um, another one of the matters of national environmental significance is listed threatened species. 
and they can be pretty well anywhere. Unlike World Heritage or Ramsar wetlands where pretty well you, you can know where they are, threatened species can be anywhere. Um, so if you're doing a project that's going to be clearing a habitat or something like that, the species can just pop up um, and you may have to consider the EPBC Act because of it. In our Carmichael case, we've got two species, particularly the black-throated finch, which is listed under the EPBC Act and we say on the evidence it looks like there's two populations left of this finch, there's like less than about 800 of them alive. Um, this population that is actually where the mine wants to be built is the biggest population of them left. There's probably about 400 individuals <coughs> in this population where the mine wants to be built. So the EPBC Act threatened species is a big problem for the Carmichael mine. Um, but you don't know where they're going to be, so it's a sort of thing, and, and bread and butter sort of work for environmental managers would be um, a project that wants to go into a particular site, you go and do a flora and fauna assessment and you would be looking for rare and threatened species um, that might be on the site, you'd be looking, you know, consulting the lists of these sorts of, uh, and you can, there's a number of different databases on a commonwealth and state level where basically you can put in your location and you get a list of all of the rare and threatened species that are like maybe on the site. So listed threatened species are a significant trigger. Um, an example of a listed threatened species is koalas um, in southeast Queensland, um, which you know can pop up obviously around Brisbane and Redlands. Um, there's also listed threatened ecological communities. So Brigalow is one of those examples, um, but there's no really good mapping at a federal level. They pretty well just give you a blob, sort of covering most of a you know, big chunk of Australia, and say somewhere within this you'll find this ecological community. Again, bread and butter work. <coughs> for environmental managers is to go out and try and map these things. Um, so this is a sort of best sort of map you can get from the Commonwealth. Um, you know, none of the highly specific property maps that you can get at a state level. This is just um, that um, threatened ecological community spread pretty well from Mackay south to the New South Wales border. Um, just as an example, there's about, or a point in time, um, uh, I just grabbed this from a Senate report. Um, there's about 1,800 species and 62 ecological communities listed under the EPBC Act. Um, a lot of endangered, a lot of vulnerable species uh, and then listed threatened ecological communities, about 64. So just to give you an idea, there's a lot of them. Um, back in 2013 as well, um, because of the political um, concerns about um, coal seam gas impacts on water, a trigger was um, enacted into the EPBC Act for coal seam gas or large coal mining developments which have a significant impact on water resources, was added as a list of matters of national environmental significance. Obviously those issues can also be dealt with at a state level under the Mineral Resources Act and the Environmental Protection Act, but the Commonwealth has this oversight role again. Um, if you think your project or action could trigger the Act, there's a three-stage referral process. You basically make a referral to the Commonwealth, um, and it's a fairly simple form, um, much simpler than what you've prepared with your development application or mining application um, at a state level. Um, you make a referral to the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth then decides if it's likely to have a significant impact or not. If they say no, then basically they say they give you that answer and you get a get out of jail free card. You don't need to go any further through the process. But if they say yes, it is a controlled action, then you go through the assessment and approval stages for the EPBC Act. Um, and I'll put that diagram, those three circles on your handout. Um, there's a number of different methods of assessment, but for most big projects now, the EPBC Act has created a system called bilateral agreements, which allow the state level EIS processes to be used. So for a big mine, they will be assessed under the, um, say the state laws, they'll, be, they'll get themselves declared a coordinated project under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act that we've talked about in earlier lectures, and then that will be used for the assessment under the EPBC Act as well. 
So it gets fed back into the EPBC Act approval process. And so that's the sort of thing that's happened for the Carmichael mine and, and, and the others. Um, there is a provision in the Act for the Commonwealth to give the approval powers to the states <coughs> to make the ultimate decision. That was really controversial and the current federal government proposed to, um, to do that. I'll come back to that actually in a moment. I'll just mention um, all states and territories have entered what are called assessment bilaterals to allow the state assessment processes to be used to assess a project but it goes back to the Commonwealth for the final decision. And in Queensland, the main one that's used for big projects is the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. Um, and I gave you this on a handout, this diagram, back when we looked at um, EIA back in Lecture 5. Um, so basically you go through the referral process. There's a number of different processes that can be used at a state at a, under the EPBC Act. But generally, um, it goes defaults to a bilateral agreement in Queensland and will be assessed, a big project is assessed under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act. Um, the current um, Commonwealth Government proposed to enter approval bilaterals with the state and was called a one-stop shop system. Um, that stalled last year um, and hasn't proceeded because Labor, the Greens and the Palmer United Party, when it was actually a party, <coughs> Um, threatened to disallow any um, approval bilateral, so they had an agreement and it's blocked the Commonwealth Government going ahead with those. Um, so I don't need to worry about approval bilaterals, but basically if you've got a big project, you need to refer it under the EPBC Act. If it's also going to be a coordinated project at the state level, the assessments will be done together. Uh, can I just emphasise a thing that I commonly see wrong um, when people explain um, on their uh, essay question on the exam, people get confused about referral processes under the EPBC Act and IDAS because we talk about referrals under IDAS as well. Can I just really make it clear, the referral process under the EPBC Act is not part of IDAS, it's not part of the information and referral stage. They use the same word but they're two different systems. So if for instance you are proposing say your development application down in you know, the Gold Coast Quarry, you prepared that under the IDAS system. Um, if you're developing particularly Site 2, you would also need to make a referral under the EPBC Act to have it assessed at that level. I didn't make that part of your group assignment because it was already big enough what you were doing and the state system is actually complicated, much more complicated than the federal one. So it's better for you to get to know the state level one so that's why I didn't make it part of the group assignment. But <coughs> um, it would be a different approval process. Um, OK, let's answer the questions about the problems considered, the three problems we've considered. So what matters of national environmental significance may be affected by, say, the mass culling of flying foxes in North Queensland? What do you guys think? World Heritage. World Heritage. Um, of the list as well, if it was to occur now, what would be the other thing you might think of? Native species. Native species, threatened species? Yes. Um, okay, Waratah coal, so we've got, what would be the sort of triggers you'd think of? So Ramsar, what else? Um, there's migratory species, there could be threatened species that are impacted by it as well, you could have multiple triggers. Um, Traveston Crossing Dam, again, you've got the Ramsar wetland, but you've also got a number of threatened species. You could have migratory species, you could have a number of different triggers. Um, so, in relation to the first um, problem, did the killing of flying foxes break any law? Um, basically what happened was, as I said, the state government refused to take any action, uh, and Carol Booth couldn't um, sue under those laws because she didn't have a legal right to do it. So she turned to the EPBC Act, which had just come into force at that time, and I was one of the lawyers that acted for her, and we sued the farmer on the basis, not because the species was listed as threatened, but because it was part of the wet tropics world heritage area, we argued that killing 10 to 30,000 of these flying foxes when there's 100,000 of them in the wet tropics, and there's critical for pollination and seed dispersal of many species within the um, rainforest and 
Um, scientists talk about them as a keystone species, so they're critical for survival of a lot of species. <coughs> so this one farmer was basically killing, wiping out this keystone species. Um, and it went to the federal court here in Brisbane, and we won. Um, the judge ruled that um, the farmer was breaching the EPBC Act, uh, that the action was likely to have a significant impact on the wet tropics world heritage um, area, and therefore granted an injunction restraining them from operating their grids. Um, the farmer then applied to the Commonwealth Government for approval because the judge made it conditional on the injunction until the farmers got approval, and the um, referral of that project was the first refusal under the EPBC Act, so it got stopped by the Commonwealth Government. And then the state government got so embarrassed by it that they banned the operation of these electric grids, uh, and the Commonwealth also listed the species as vulnerable to extinction because there'd been this rapid decline. So the court case had a lot of good outcomes for the species, and thankfully it's um, still around. Uh, yeah, because it was basically being wiped out by these electric grids. Um, so you can, if you're interested in that case, uh, it's one of the case studies on my website. Yep, David. Yep. How did she? Good question. Um, she trespassed on the land to get the footage, uh, and that footage was used in the court case. Um, she was able to still use that evidence. Um, actually, not being a police person was useful in that case because our courts prevent police using evidence that's illegally obtained. But if you're a private citizen, the same rules don't apply. There's a discretion to exclude it, but in that case, that discretion wasn't exercised, and so the evidence went in. If a police person had done that, though, without a warrant, they wouldn't have been able to rely upon the evidence. So. Um, oh, sorry, and this is um, that flying fox, the little one that she, um, she actually took it off the farm, and she was a flying fox carer, and she um, raised it and then let it go. Um, so it was it, uh, and it, she called it Stephen after um, this um, really nice barrister in Queensland who's done a lot of environmental work called Stephen Kine. And I actually thought it was really cool because in the federal court, um, barristers dress up in black gowns, so black capes. We don't actually wear a wig. And if you turn yourself on your head, um, you'll actually see uh, that this picture is a really good likeness for a barrister <laughs> because they've got a black cape. And so I thought it was funny. We'd be going to court and we were dressing as our clients. We'd go dressed as bats. The judge would, dress that, it would show up dressed as a bat. And, and um, no one, though, tried to d have a, you know, not act on the fact that she was biased for bats because she was dressed as a bat. It didn't happen. So there you go. Turn yourself on your head, you'll see a barrister. Okay, so problems two and three. Do these projects need approval under the EPB Act? If so, how does the approval process operate and is, it, is approval likely to be given? You can read <coughs> about the approval process on the Commonwealth um, EPB Act website. Um, basically, if we looked at Problem two, um, Peter Garrett made this amazing decision. He said, piss off. Um, under the Act, it allows a quick refusal, and he said, this proposal is clearly unacceptable um, because of its impacts on the Ramsar wetlands, and there's no way I'm going to let you build it. So don't bother going through the EIS process. Um, however, um, I'm really keen for you to still build the mine just not the port. So basically Waratah then put in a new application um, where the mine was still proposed but it would go out through Mackay rather than having their own separate... Um, it was the port that was the problem, not the coal mine. Um, so it got knocked back under the EPB Act. Amazing decision. I was just gobsmacked at the time. The Traveston Crossing Dam was another amazing decision, again by Peter Garrett. Um, he refused this dam after it had gone through the full EIS process and the state government coordinator general had recommended approval because he basically thought the EIS that the coordinator general had done was a load of bullshit. Um, and he went out and got his own independent, independent experts to advise him and they said, actually this dam's going to have all these bad impacts on these threatened species. So he concluded that it would have unacceptable impacts on those threatened species, particularly uh, Australian lungfish, Mary River turtle, and the Mary River cod. Uh, and it would pr lead to serious and irreversible consequences um, and lead to their further decline. So he refused it. It was a state government project, 
and the Commonwealth Government knocked it back. It was amazing. Similar in many ways, if you think back to the um, Tasmanian Dam case that we started with, that was a state government project. The Hydroelectric Commission was basically a state government entity. So proposed at a state level, state government support, Commonwealth Government knocked it back. Traverson Crossing Dam, very similar story, state government project, Commonwealth knocked it back. Um, so I've used these examples because they're um, interesting. The re reality is, though, projects are rarely refused under the EPBC Act, so I don't think it's going to be a saviour for... It, it typically isn't. Um, but it still plays an important role, particularly as a check on large state-sponsored projects, so it does have an important role to play. So just wrapping up, we started with a story, the history of the Tasmanian Dam case, and that was really the the background to how we get to the situation now where the Commonwealth actually has this big bit of legislation, the EPBC Act, that is um, recognised as lawfully constraining activities, including of state government projects. Uh, and then we looked at these three different projects to illustrate the matters of national environmental significance. So you can read a summary of the EPBC Act in my synopsis book. Um, and final slide. Um, the take-home points from this lecture, if I summarise them in these five points. Under Section 5129 of the Commonwealth Constitution, the Commonwealth Government has power to enact legislation that is reasonably capable of being considered appropriate and adapted to fulfil Australia's international legal obligations. Due to the width of Australia's international legal obligations, this gives the Commonwealth a wide power to make laws to protect the environment. That's the first point, an important one. Under Section 109, the Commonwealth um, laws prevail over state laws to the extent of inconsistency, which means that the Commonwealth sits on top. The EPBC Act is the cornerstone of Commonwealth environment laws, and the major trigger for approval under it is impacts on matters of national environmental significance, such as World Heritage Areas. It's important to be aware about, of that, and it's something that I would want you to address in the major essays you do on your um, end of semester exam. Fourthly, um, while state approvals are much more numerous and projects are rarely stopped under the EPBC Act, it plays an important role for environmental regulation in Australia, particularly as a check on state-sponsored projects. And finally, the EPBC Act referral process for controlled actions is not part of the IDAS system under SPA, so they're two separate processes. So most things are summarised on the handout, though. Great. Okay, thank you very much, and um, that's the lecture.